After the birth of Jane Ives, the telekinetically powered girl commonly known as Eleven in 1971, Dr. Martin Brenner could only perform limited experiments until she was old enough to perform some larger tasks. These tasks are what led to her interacting with the Demogorgon in roughly 1983, but its history may go much deeper than what we see on screen. The Demogorgon is an otherworldly creature, so to understand it, we're going to look at how its form was inspired by the beasts of our world, and analyze its story seen in Stranger Things and the Stranger Things comic series. I'll also be exploring what really happened to the Demogorgon, and the hidden connection it shares with Eleven. So stick around to the end of this video to hear all about it. This video is sponsored by Raycon. The Demogorgon is a monster from an alternate dimension that spent its life in darkness and decay, stalking around the area referred to as Mirkwood to find its next meal before slipping back behind the curtain that separates its cold abyss from our own dimension. Welcome to Horror History, in this video I'll be covering the being known as the Demogorgon, and in future videos I'll go over other members of the Demogorgon species. It's kind of like how an alien we have the Xenomorph, who is also part of the Xenomorph species. The actual name of the Demogorgon, or its species, is not known. The characters just come up with that name based on this demon Prince character from the game that they're playing, Dungeons and Dragons, which may be partially based off the forbidden primeval god from ancient Greek mythology. Not much is known about the Demogorgon prior to its appearance in Hawkins, however, in analyzing what the Demogorgon truly represents and embodies the community of Hawkins, we have to take this all the way back to the 1940s. Roll the horror history screen. With the Cold War spanning the majority of the 20th century, Americans were generally concerned about communism spreading through their communities and the government. This eventually led to McCarthyism and Truman's loyalty program in an attempt to curb the worries of the citizens. McCarthyism was a campaign from 1950 to 1954 that was run by Senator Joseph McCarthy, who claimed that there were communists hiding in plain sight in the US government, along with other major institutions. It's basically like how there are people who are subscribed to this channel, but they don't have the death bell and like, I know you're out there, and I will find you. McCarthyism devolved into basically an early version of cancel culture where people who maybe weren't communist ended up on blacklists and sometimes lost their jobs. So the Truman Loyalty Program was made to root out communists and prevent them from entering government positions. But you're probably wondering what the frick this has to do with old flower face over here. I swear, I'm getting to that. So you may remember in season 3, semi-spoiler alert for season 3 I guess, that the kids discover a whole Russian communist operation underneath the town. But the original Demogorgon and the experiments at Hawkins Lab served as a more covert symbol for the communist agenda way back in the first season. I don't know why I'm saying way back, as if it was really that long ago. So anyway, the US Central Intelligence Agency was disturbed and intrigued by prisoners of war coming back from the Korean War and talking about communist propaganda. And they believed this could be a form of Russian mind control, so they launched Project MK Ultra in April of 1953. Despite how it sounds, this was no electronic music festival. They used certain active substances to try to make advancements in mind control to combat Russia. In Stranger Things, the Hawkins National Lab uses MK Ultra to explain how Eleven might have obtained her psycho kinetic abilities. It's suggested through her mother's participation in secret experiments that continued on past the initial end of MK Ultra, which was sometime in 1973. You can actually see MK Ultra included in part of an article title in a newspaper story about Hawkins Laboratory that Hopper finds in the library. This article is potentially from around 1975, which is when some of the details of the project were initially released to the public. So the fear of trouble in Hawkins that arises when residents start going missing is akin to the hysteria that swept across America during the communist scare lasting until the USSR dissolved in the early 90s. It's been suggested that the Demogorgon is the upside-down version of L, seeing as how they are the only ones of their kinds to exhibit telekinesis. There are other examples, which we'll get to. Eleven was born in 71, but Dr. Brenner held larger tests that led to her interaction with the Demogorgon in roughly 1983. Her first encounter with it is when she's sent telepathically to listen to a Russian man's conversation. We don't see the Demogorgon in the scene, however we are able to hear its screech, or is it a roar? This could be because Eleven and the Demogorgon are linked, and its scream is because it shares the same fear that she holds being forced into the deprivation tank. The scream sounds like a cross between a dinosaur and a slowed down orangutan. <laughs> It also sounds a little bit like me whenever I get put on hold. All representatives are currently assisting other customers. Please stay on the line. Eleven is encouraged by Brenner to face the monster she saw again by diving back into the sensory deprivation tanks. When she does find it, the Demogorgon feeds on what looks like either a giant egg similar to the one seen in the Upside Down or a tree stump covered in sap. Only when she touches its back is when it finally acknowledges her and lets out a massive... roar? 
We're sorry, all of our representatives are still busy. This scares Eleven back into our reality once she's met with the Demogorgon's face, which opens like a series of flower petals resembling a squid's tentacles, opening to engulf its prey. The Demogorgon has a series of sharp canines, while squids have sharp rings on their clubbed tentacles to help grip their prey effectively and rip it apart. The comparison holds up in later scenes where we see the Demogorgon eating in a similar style, including the squid's tendency to start eating prey while it's still alive like one of those Korean mukbang chicks. The next time the Demogorgon appears is when the gate between the Upside Down and our dimension is opened on November 6, 1980. It takes this chance to hunt everyone in the lab that it can locate. We can assume it devoured as much as it could in this short time span in a similar way to how some carnivores engage in what is known as opportunity hunting. For example, you'll see bears do this because they need to quickly gain enough weight for hibernation. The Demogorgon could share a similar mentality since fresh food is usually a limited resource for it in the Upside Down, which is mainly void of other life forms. You'll also notice that Eleven has to relieve her hunger around this time, but her victims come in the form of Eggo Waffles. Rather than returning to the Upside Down, the flower face becomes the enemy in the shadows and begins roaming the woods around town for fresh prey. It specifically stays in the same area Will and his friends call Mirkwood. The area it stays in is small because it's the closest area to the portal and because it's the same area that Will is hiding in in the Upside Down. On the surface, Hawkins is your standard small town America, where nothing really happens and everyone is somewhat familiar with each other. It's 1983, and most of the families we see are the typical nuclear family. The Cold War frequently comes up in conversation, usually through references to Russian commies or communists. While Hawkins doesn't stand out, is being special and is meant to be the stereotypical small town from the 80s, it does highlight the nagging sense of anxiety that everyone around you could be a communist below the surface. For the residents, life is fairly simple, with lines being drawn to distinguish what is considered normal and what is not. Things that are not normal are frequently met with criticism and disbelief, which reflects on the mentality during the Cold War where Americans were on high alert about potential communists. This is reflected in how the town treats certain families. The buyers live in a secluded area that's just outside of town, and Joyce is divorced. Despite having two kids and a dog, they don't fit the standard white picket fence idea of a perfect family. The series even opens with a peek into how their lifestyle is not so average. With it, Jonathan is taken an almost father-like role, while also trying to be Will's older brother. Then we have the Wheeler family. They serve as what is considered the typical nuclear family. Nancy describes her parents' marriage as her mother marrying well, finding the perfect house at the end of the cul-de-sac, and raising the perfect family in the perfect house. I don't think my parents ever loved each other. You must have married for some reason. My mom was young. My dad was older, but he had a cushy job. Money came from a good family. So they bought a nice house at the end of the cul-de-sac started their nuclear family. Then she perfectly shoots a can when she's never handled a gun before, the same way she gets everything right on her flashcards. On the night of November 6, Will Byers is going home after a D&D campaign with his friends, and cuts through Mirkwood. This is when the Demogorgon comes after Will, and the lights flicker as he runs from it. We don't see the monster in the scene, but we can hear it screeching in the night. This could potentially be it using sound in a similar way to how bats use sonar waves to detect objects in order to navigate through the dark, since the Demogorgon doesn't appear to have eyes. Nancy and Jonathan also later determined that the Demogorgon hunts by tracking blood, similar to a shark. When it catches up with him, the Demogorgon is able to warp Will into the Upside Down by weakening the fabric between the dimensions, and, like a shark, the creature closes in on its meal. I can't believe how long it's been since we did one with Raycon. I actually still have my original pair that they sent me over two years ago. They still work, but I like the black ones. Gotta stay on brand. I'm using these things all the time during my workouts and runs. For some reason, other brands don't really make these things ear-shaped, so they just fall out. But the Raycons stay in, thanks to their optimized gel tips. The new everyday earbuds offer an improved rubber oil look and feel. With eight hours of playtime, you can listen to the first 12 Weezer albums in one sitting. And thanks to the charging case, you get 32 hours of battery life overall. There's also a built-in mic, so you can take calls at the press of a button. Hold on. Oh, hey PewDiePie. Yeah, I'm recording a Raycon ad right now. I can help you with your content strategy stuff a little bit later. All right, later. Raycon started at half the price of other premium audio brands, but they sound just as good and come with a 45-day happiness guarantee. E you already know what to do. Click the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash world to unlock exclusive deals up to 20% off your Raycon order. That's buyraycon.com slash world. Thank you. 
After chasing the Demogorgon off by firing the gun, Will wanders around in the Upside Down's version of his house, where he struggles to communicate with his mom or anyone from the top side. Will explores the distorted version of his house, and eventually falls asleep beneath a Jaws poster in his mock room, maybe a clue about the creature's blood-sensing abilities. Back on the surface, the town itself is temporarily thrown into a seemingly lackluster disarray when it's announced that Will Byers went missing on his way home. Even Police Chief Hopper initially takes the information almost lightheartedly when Joyce includes the detail that Will's a target of bullying at school, along with Will's father calling him queer, called him a this line of questioning, along with Joyce begging Hopper to believe her, can parallel a representation of Truman's loyalty policies. These insist that people should trust the government to do what was necessary to keep communism out of their neighborhoods. It's only after Joyce answers Hopper's questions that he appears more interested in the case. Unfortunately for Hawkins, the monster that infiltrated their town is far more than a communist. The Demogorgon's presence shows the nature of the hysteria involved with speculating that there's a communist hiding next door. We can get a grasp on this representation by using aspects from the first chapter of Jeffrey Cohen's monster theory, along with a historical perspective. The book presents seven theses, each involving various creatures being a symbolic representation of the cultures that created them. For the infiltration of Hawkins, we can refer to thesis number four, where monsters are embodiments of what's different. Cohen writes that the creature can be a form of the other, and in this case, that other is the Russians. When Will wakes up to find himself still trapped in the Upside Down, he tries to communicate with his mom. The activity ends up attracting the Demogorgon back to him as a form of connection is established through his supercom. Luckily, Will manages to the Demogorgon off a second time by shooting at it, but uses the last of his ammunition. Meanwhile, search parties continue combing the woods for Will, but his friends are not content with sitting at home doing nothing. Eleven tries to explain where Will is by flipping their D&D board over and placing Will's wizard token in the center. Hiding from the bad man? There's no such thing as the bad man. Shut up, Gordon. You don't show up till season three. L places the Demogorgon token next to Will's wizard piece. This explains how they come to associate the name Demogorgon with the monster, a name that sticks from then on. I've also seen it suggested that the Demogorgon token having two heads could be a potential clue about duality, if in fact the Demogorgon is the upside down version of Eleven. On Tuesday night, Nancy Wheeler brings her friend Barb to a party at Steve Harrington's house. Barb ends up sitting by the pool after cutting her hand and a blood drop falls into the water, which is likely what drew the Demogorgon to her. It appears behind her, as seen in Jonathan Byer's photographs and brings her into the Upside Down. Barb screams Echo through the Upside Down as she's dragged into the empty pool by the Demogorgon. Will, who is still hiding there, can hear her screams along with the Demogorgon's cry, and he runs out towards the screams in an attempt to help her. But he's too late. Will returns to the Upside Down version of his home and is able to talk to his mom again, but also draws the Demogorgon's attention again. This time it goes for Mrs. Byers by ripping a hole in the wall Andy Bernard style. It seems to be able to sense where the veil between the worlds is thinner and it'll prioritize getting more people rather than always taking the easiest target. I mean, it's obviously to make the show more dramatic, but if I had to give it a logical reason, uh, yeah, let's go with that thing I said. We see a similar scene later on. This time, Will takes his mom's advice and runs for it. Then, in the underground lab, a scientist explores the Upside Down, communicating via the microphone in his suit. He is basically the Demogorgon equivalent of that light-up sign at Krispy Kreme that says hot donuts. When the other scientists desperately try to pull him back, they end up with just some spine and rib cage tied to the chain that was around his waist. Hey, at least food's not going to waste. Since the Demogorgon has infiltrated Hawkins from the Upside Down, it's easy to say that the Upside Down itself is the equivalent of the Iron Curtain. The Iron Curtain was an implied wall in Europe that separated areas controlled by the Soviet Union and Western-controlled allies. Those who crossed over to the Soviet side of the curtain in the mid-80s may be greeted with floating particles of ash similar to those seen in the Upside Down, because that's exactly what happened after the Chernobyl disaster in 1986 when a reactor melted down and forced evacuations for hundreds of miles around the city of Pripyat. This could also explain why the Upside Down is mostly deserted, other than this strange mutated creature. These attributes could also be related to the meltdown in Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania in the US, which was designed to compete with Russian advances in nuclear technology. Just as Godzilla rose from Japan in the fallout of their nuclear disaster, history itself can become the monster, and events of days past can turn fears of contamination into the horrors on your TV screen. Or whatever the f you watch this show on. Nancy and Jonathan decide to hunt down the Demogorgon in the woods. They stumble across a dying deer, but before putting it out of its misery, it's abruptly deeded back into the bushes. Nancy ends up following the red trail through a portal at the base of a tree and discovers the Demogorgon. Well, we've all seen someone do this at the local discount buffet, right? It uses its squid-like face to rip its meal to pieces, not even realizing that there are other patrons at the buffet. However, when the Demogorgon does realize that Nancy is there, it chases her into hiding and traps her by blocking the portal back to the real world, which tells us that the monster does have some intelligence. Nancy hears Jonathan's voice calling from the other side of the tree portal, which seems to be closing, but Nancy isn't the 
only one who hears him. Will is also close enough to hear his brother, and ends up finding Nancy along with the portal and the Demogorgon. Instead of going for the portal himself, Will distracts the Demogorgon with a rock so Nancy can escape. The Demogorgon takes the next easy meal, the hunter Henry, who had been recently trapped in the Upside Down. Exhausted and beginning to hallucinate, Will goes to the last safe place he can think of, Castle Byers. Unfortunately for him, it's not as safe as he believes. As Will lays in his fort, Castle Byers, Eleven visits him psychokinetically to tell him that his mother is coming for him and to hold on a little while longer. After she vanishes, Will starts muttering the lyrics to his favorite The Clash song, Okay Will, I see you, but unfortunately, so does the Demogorgon, sending it straight to his location. If Eleven and the Demogorgon are linked, it stands to reason that when Eleven found Will, she accidentally tipped off his location. Basically, anything she knows, the Demogorgon knows, and this happens multiple times. We see a similar concept with Will and the Mind Flayer in Season 2. It seems to be implied that Will is unable to escape this time, but our friend Flowerface has bigger plans for him than simply making him a midnight snack. Will finds himself deep within the creature's nest, with some kind of face-hugging organism plastered to his mouth. I'm guessing this is because Will is so small that the Demogorgon would prefer to make him a carrier rather than a meal. The slug implanted within him appears to be the Demogorgon's offspring. I don't know if that makes the Demogorgon male or female, and I don't really want to think about it, so let's just skip to Nancy and Jonathan setting up the trap on Friday the 11th. They end up cutting their own palms to lure it back to the smell of their blood. However, the monster is too powerful and knocks Jonathan down while surviving every bullet Nancy has in her gun. Which kind of begs the question why it was afraid of Will's gun earlier on, but I mean maybe it was just a case of the creature not knowing its own power, like how if you tie down an elephant with a small rope, it won't realize that it can escape. Just before it's about to strike Nancy, Steve Harrington rushes in, using the nailed bat, and starts taking it to the monster Chris Bryant style. The three of them manage to get the monster's foot stuck in the bear trap and light it on fire. As Jonathan puts the flames out, they find the beast gone, only the dissolving remnants of flesh clinging to the trap, presumably having been driven back into its own dimension. While Chief Hopper and Will's mom are rescuing him from the Upside Down, Dr. Brenner and his people storm the school to try to kidnap Eleven. She uses her abilities to squeeze the brains of all of the bad men threatening her friends, but the use of her powers once again causes a nosebleed and attracts the Demogorgon. The kids run to try to get to safety in the science classroom. The boys scream for Lucas to get the wrist rocket out as the Demogorgon breaks down the door, following the scent of Eleven's blood. While the rocks don't actually do much damage, Eleven recovers just enough to send the monster flying into the back wall, and with a parting farewell, proceeds to disintegrate the Demogorgon, disappearing into the Upside Down herself as she does so. It's very interesting how when they come face to face, they are practically mirror images of each other, and the only way for Elle to defeat it or get rid of it hurts her and transports her to the Upside Down. This isn't proof that she's the Demogorgon and the Demogorgon is her, but I can't ignore the fact that she sees herself as the monster. Elle! Mike. I'm sorry. Sorry? What are you sorry for? The gate. I opened it. I'm the monster. So if Elle is the Demogorgon and she survives this battle, seemingly being transported back to the Upside Down, it's possible that Old Flower Face survives too, just as the idea of communism has somehow survived over many wars and many years. Or it could just be that the creature seen in Russia at the end of the third season is just another member of the same species. Either way, the analogy probably stands. If you want to see the histories of more horror monsters, click that playlist on the left. We've got more Stranger Things episodes coming, so remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring the death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one, assuming we both survive.